Thank you. Now is everybody awake? <laughs> All right, good morning, everybody. How many are filled with pancake? Yeah, so am I, so try to stay awake. <laughs> this is our Glen Miller Birthplace Society panel. It varies every year, and uh, we have some new faces this year, and uh, two people you've seen before. And I wasn't going to say old faces, but they are getting older, aren't we all, all right? So, uh, we will introduce them to you, and if you have a question a little bit later on, raise your hand, I'll come out and find you, and away we go. Uh, this is just kind of a free-for-all of talking about Glenn Miller, his music, the big band era, and uh, why these people have been attracted to it. Uh, in the way of introductions, let me go ladies first. Uh, this lady was born into it. <laughs> Welcome Chan Everly, the daughter of Glenn Miller's boy singer, Ray Everly. She's had a singing career of her own. She has a book out about her dad, and uh, she'll fill us in on some of all those things. Next up is Dennis Sprague on the end there. He has literally written the book. He has a pre presentation after this one. Uh, he, do we now call you the director of the archive? Do you have a title? Yeah. Janitor of the Glenmore Archive in Boulder, Colorado. He's representing the state of Glen Miller today as well. And so he's a man who knows a lot about a lot of things. Now, these next two fellows are fellows I really haven't met before. So we're going to learn together. This man is from Dusseldorf, Germany. His name is Reinhard Scheer Hennings. All right. He is another Glenn Miller collector, and uh, Dennis says he's helped him with research as well as our next fellow here, David Fletcher from Richmond, Virginia. So give all these fine folks. You notice we have an empty chair here. This is in memory of our dear friend Alan Cass who was longtime director of the archive of, uh, well, he literally put it on the map in Boulder, Colorado at the university there. And he, of course, passed away last year. So Alan sat on this panel for many, many years. Well, Dennis, let's start with you. You said you have some greetings to give us. We do. Um, John, Johnny Miller would like to express her love and appreciation for all of you, and she would regret if you could not come this weekend. There are some health issues at home to prevent her from coming with her husband, Vernon, but she wanted to give you all her greetings. All right, thank you. Um, before we go any further, I told Carrie when we started, I would do a little bit of background on these two characters. We <laughs> um, David is a shy fellow. He got his wish last night. The band played Song of the Bayou. <laughs> He's been asking for it for years. And Nick finally, uh, in your way of thinking, finally has ceded to your request. So I hope, I was worried that he might not survive. <laughs> I won the war of attrition. Yes. David, I would characterize David as a very tenacious researcher. He's probably the best bird dog I know in terms of finding facts and details. He's always sending me things that I didn't know were findable, and he's a wonderful resource. Um, before I talk a little bit about Reinhardt, I want to interject something about both of these men. The University of Colorado in Boulder has a great 
advantage as, as a center for archives, and there are, other, there are many advantages, but one is the network of collectors and researchers at other universities and in private life that have given of their time, their knowledge, and even their treasure to the um, furtherance of the legacy of Glenn Miller and the Big Band era. So these guys are here up today for a reason. They know a lot, they care a lot, and they have much to share. That's an introduction to my friend from Dusseldorf, Reinhardt. We've become very close over the years. Reinhardt is known, and he'll, he'll be embarrassed when I say this, for being the premier and expert and collector of Artie Shaw that exists on this planet. And I think that's a fair comment. He would deny it, but I think it's a fair comment. It's true, much as you will. So please feel free to ask either one of these men. David knows much about Tom Dorsey um, and other bands. Reinhardt's are big on, on Artie, but they both know as much about Glenn as anybody walking around, except perhaps for Ed. So um, with that, that's All where right. we are. OK, well, we're glad you're here. Jan, yes. what have you been doing lately? You uh, participated in our scholarship uh, competition. I did. Um, I've been here 14 years with the Ray Early uh, Vocal Scholarship. And a few months ago, um, I heard that our chairman of this program uh, was going to be having uh, some surgery. So I was asked whether or not I would step in and host the thing, and I thought, you know, I've been doing this long enough. I think I ought to be able to pull it off. So uh, it was a pleasure. It's a little exhausting, and it's constant go, but I'll tell you what, we had some of the absolute most talented uh, artists, students, um, and I'll say in the country, because this is a national scholarship event, uh, and people don't realize that. So if you're here, and you're in the top 10, when you get here, you're already a winner. You know, I'm in the top 10 finalists of a national scholarship event. So we had a marvelous time yesterday. I do scholarship work at home as well with the State College of Florida. I mentor young uh, music students there, have a blast doing that. Um, and, and since I retired um, from singing about five or six years ago, this is really what fills me. Uh, I don't know, I, I don't think any one thing defines us, but it's a passion, we'll just say that. So ever since I got involved here with the scholarship program, I'm involved in other aspects of that back home in Florida. Um, I, I have, I just had my fourth book come out in the fall. It's another children's book called Winnie's Farm. So I've got two children's books and two biographies. One is my father's story. Um, I, as I said, I have um, retired from singing. Although I did a number last year, so I guess I'm not fully retired. I'm just sort of putting it over there. But that is also something I enjoyed for a very long time. And it was uh, singing uh, big band music. I was a second generation big band singer for 35 years. So this is who I am today. And I'm enjoying it very much. Well, we're glad you're here. What has this organization given you over the 14 years you've been coming here? Awareness. You know, awareness, uh, I mean, not really, the, not really with my father's background. And I mean, I, I've been representing my father since he died when I was 19 as his, as his official representative, um, you know, to watch over his, his, uh, his history as a singer and, you know, and everything. So I've always felt and knew that, but I really do think the scholarship program is what knocked me out. That really, really, and my father would have been like, "Oh, this is cool. I mean, we have to do this." So, yeah. I'm glad that that all came about. Me too. David, how did you get interested in Glenn Miller? How far back do you go? And you're going to have to get right into the microphone there. Uh, two words: my mother. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> Mom was a college student from 1940 to 44, a high school student. 36 to 40. Of course, we know what happened during that span of eight years. Uh, but she never, she never lost touch with that music. And uh, I was a childhood piano student and had an aptitude for it. 
and I was just attracted to this music that would come wafting down the hall from the master bedroom area where she'd be in there sewing and playing her old records from college, you know, Shellac 78s, Miller and Dorsey and Shaw, she'd stack them on the changer, and I'd hear one after the other, and after a while, just because I got curious, because it wasn't what was coming out of my older brother's room, which was the Rolling Stones and the Beatles. <laughs> well, what is that? And it sounded more like what I was learning on the piano than what was coming out of my brother's room. And so I learned, by the time I was 10, what a Glenn Miller record sounded like and what a Tommy Dorsey record sounded like. And I decided I liked them quite a bit. And once I found out that I could afford to buy my own LPs, I went out and did that. And before long, I played piano in the high school stage band. And this is something I recommend to every kid. Play in a really bad band. <laughs> because once you've done that, you realize just how good the really good bands were. Yeah. And those were the two biggest influences, I think. To be able to sit down with out of tune saxophones and clarinets and then listen to the real thing at home and develop a, an abiding love and respect for that music. Like many of us, that's how we learned. Brian Walt, how did you learn about Glenn Miller in Germany? I threw my, different from David Boyd, was his mother. In my case, it was my father. Uh, he grew up, he was born in 1929, and he grew up in Germany in the 1930s. Under, the, under Adolf Hitler, um, and he and my mother, who's Dutch, they would uh, listen to the BBC during World War II, and my grandfather, uh, his mother, of course, and my grandfather, who was at the time still with the, he was a member of the Nazi party, he was, very, he was scared to death uh, that they would listen to the BBC to find out what was really happening, although I guess the BBC also had a, a number of pro propaganda aspects, but anyway, they were listening to what in Germany is called the Feindsender. And uh, that was, you were risking death penalty. So uh, he survived the war, as did, uh, as did the entire family. And with the American soldiers occupying Germany came American music. And for most of the young kids, uh, swing and jazz was a revelation. It was new, because uh, until 1945, jazz and swing music uh, were forbidden. They were uh, looked at as uh, subculture, uh, Denigrated music, yeah, music for basically for idiots. Uh, so that all changed in 1945, and suddenly the German youth, and also in Austria, and I guess in, uh, in Bill Baker, he should also know, he said he had uh, Netherlands and Belgium that should also uh, open up a little bit, although they, they had a few, quite a few good swing bands in the 1930s. So my father got in touch with swing, uh, and he started to like Glenn Miller, Benny Goodman, Fats Waller and a number of other musicians. So then at one point he met my mother, uh, they got married, they moved to the United States, I got along, I was born in New York, and uh, they tried to put me to music school early on when I was six and seven, and I told them music is nonsense, I don't need music. <laughs> <laughs> How wrong that was. <laughs> so um, that held on until I was 16 and 17, and then in school I was sort of an outsider because all my friends listened to music that David just mentioned the Beatles, Rolling Stones, Elvis Presley, whatever it was hip at the time, uh, and I just didn't like it. There was just one record I liked, uh, and I heard that quite frequently, and that was Bing Crosby for the Jimmy Dorsey Orchestra, I'm an Old Cowhand from 1936. <laughs> and I still cherish this record to, to this very day. <laughs> but other than that, I liked musicals like an American Paris singing in the rain, Easter Parade, um, but that sort of was an on and off thing. And, at one point, I was 15 in 1976, in September, uh, I went through my father's records, LPs of course, most of the time, at, at that time, mostly LPs, he didn't have any show -ups. and I pulled out records, Benny Goodman, Tommy Dorsey, and I had then this uh, RCA double LP album, Glenn Miller and the Army Air Force Band. And at random, I put on one of the two sides, I think, it was, it was in the mood, I used to know which uh, side was on, but it doesn't matter. So I listened to it in the mood, and I was flabbergasted. It was also like an umbrella opening up for me, and I thought, this, this is really good, I like this. And for a few weeks, I would listen only in the mood, and then occasionally, okay, Tuxedo Junctions, uh, Song of the Volga Boatman, 
uh, and uh, flying home, uh, Taylor and Charlie, and I really liked it. And then occasionally I would say, okay, now I understand Glenn Miller, let's pull out Tommy Dorsey's Song of India, not bad. Opus number one, very good, but I didn't like it at the point. And that's how I grew. And then uh, a year, about half a year later, I got my first uh, LPs with Glenn Miller at Chex, one which I think Nick Hilcher mentioned yesterday after the concert, the double LP album, uh, uh, the legendary performer with Air Checks from 1939 to 1942. And I told David at breakfast this morning, when I listened to that record, at that time I was embarrassed to listen to the announcements because I was not prepared for that. So whenever Hugh James came up or um, Alan Robinson could be heard doing the announcement, I would immediately turn down the volume because I thought it was embarrassing. I, was, I felt funny. And that sort of then, of course, that eased up. And uh, so I got going on Glenn Miller. That was at, the, at that time my primary interest, and with a little bit Ellington, Basie, Benny Goodman. And I asked my father, because when you sometimes looked at the back of uh, LPs or red liner notes, you read Artie Shaw. And I said, so I asked my father, who's Artie Shaw? Oh, I'm not sure. That's some kind of jazz musician, kind of player. But you need to listen to Benny Goodman, okay? So then in the summer of 1977, we spent two weeks on Long Island. I remember it because um, I, I said to my father, we need to go to a record store. And there was still, at that time, they had a very nice Sam Goody with an excellent uh, selection. And we went there the day after Elvis Presley died. And the thing I remember is we went to the store, there was a big sign, and it says, we have no more Elvis Presley sold out. Yeah, they had gone sold out within about 24 hours or so. And I bought my first uh, three Artie Shaw LPs. Uh, the double RCA Victor album, This is Artie Shaw, with a selection from 1938 to 1941. And then the first two Bluebird albums from 1938 to 1939. So we went back home, and I started listening to them. I said to my father, look, this is the music you've been denying uh, to me. This is much better than any group, but we didn't have one record. Uh, and uh, from then on, we would have ongoing disputes and feuds, and uh, he said, you must get away from this Artie Shaw. <laughs> and uh, I kept going, and uh, at one point, uh, you realize, of course, that you, I, I read at one point that air checks have a lot more dynamics and are a lot livelier. And then you realize that most of the commercial uh, issues, they're edited, they have uh, broadcasts that are cut in, in pieces, uh, or sometimes they even exchange tunes. And I tried to find out where you could find broadcast and then this is how the journey started and today it's a, uh, it's a commitment. I, I'm a diehard collector and I enjoy it, it, it relaxes me. Sometimes it's not relaxing if you lose the play and if you would like to win but uh, it's fun. I enjoy it. And it's, uh, this is my first time here and I actually do already regret I wasn't here earlier. It's a great honor to be here and uh, thanks to you Dennis I'm, I have the opportunity to sit here and tell you a little bit about my collecting activities. Two comments from what David and Reinhardt just said, and I hope I don't embarrass you with one. Um, David mentioned his mother, and that made me think, and, and the thought process is that Glenn Miller's Bluebird records, particularly the ballads, were very popular among teenage women at the time. And this rings a bell for me because in my experience at home growing up, um, the 78 records that still existed in the home at the time. And we were, I was in a very fortunate household to have a father who was in the <coughs> entertainment industry and had the ability to you know, order any RCA Victor product that existed. It was special to someone who was just discovering big bands because all these albums and even 45s could come into the house if we at, upon a request, because they were radio station broadcasting demo copies. But that's beside the point. The um, popularity of Glenn Miller among young women, I think his experience and mine would be that, in my case, my, the Bluebird records that were in the house had been my mother's before my parents met. And I suspect that's true of a lot of, of, of couples from that era. Now, that's just an aside about the popularity of Glenn Miller's music. Now, as far as Reinhardt is concerned, he didn't mention something about his family, which I wanted to ask him to talk about, because he mentioned something to me the other day, which is an 
a little bit off of Glenn Miller, but it's a very relevant point and a very important point about our world and how we perceive history. And it's a very touching story, I thought, about a, a gentleman, a, an aristocrat, not necessarily, a, a, actually a commoner who rose through the ranks of the Kriegsmarine, the German Navy, and did something which I think was very special about show, about denying himself a title to show that his, his sailors, that, he, that they too could rise through the ranks. What you may not know about Reinhardt is the identity of his great-grandfather, which I would like him to reveal. I'll be happy to, yeah. I'm sort of uh, a mixed bag when it comes to my background. Uh, so probably most of you would think I'm just purely German, but that's not so. Um, my father's German, but he had a Dutch mother and a German father. And I'll come to the German father in a second. The other half of my family is Belgian. Uh, my mother is Belgian, so I'm 50% Belgian, 25% Dutch, 25% German. Which sort of puts me on every side <laughs> of my <laughs> And uh, I have two passports, a German passport, but also a US passport, because I was born in New York City. And I still pay every year a nice amount of money to the Internal Revenue Service. <laughs> uh, so, and, um, so, but uh, my grandfather, my father's father, he was um, the, uh, the son of a Navy officer in the late 19th century. His name was Rudolf Hennings. And he married a woman, Amelia Moore, but he died very soon. He died in 1897 or 1896 as a result of a hornet's b uh, bite into the eye. And as a result, he died. So there was then this young Emilia Moore with young Rudolf. She called uh, the son who was born after his father was dead. She called him Rudolf. So there was Emilia Moore with Rudolf Hennings. Um, and she met another Navy officer, Reinhard Scheer, who was at that time a, either a, c a commander or a captain. And they married. They had two daughters. And uh, Reinhard Scheer rose through the ranks of the Navy until 1940. By that time, he was a rear admiral. Then he was promoted to vice admiral. And in 1916, in January 1916, he took over the command of the German High Seas Fleet. And until that time, the German High Seas Fleet had been uh, hemmed in by the blockade of the Royal Navy and had more or less accepted that position and had been quite inactive in, uh, in, in, in the North Sea while the Royal, Royal Navy kept, kept up the cordon or the the blockade, which uh, also cut up Germany in World War I from all the trade and commerce. So he changed that and became a lot more aggressive. And the German Hochsee Flotte Heißes Fleet, they left the harbor on 31st of May 1916 and eventually ran into the Royal Navy because both navies had, uh, had through secret sources, the spies found out that they had left the harbor. So they met, met in the uh, middle of the North, North Sea near the uh, near Jutland, and that became the famous great battle of Jutland, in German it's called the Schlacht of uh, Skagerrak, and which was the largest sea battle of uh, naval history. Um, in that battle, the Germans succeeded in sinking more English ships and uh, killed more unfortunate British soldiers and came away with less losses in material ships and sailors. But Admiral Scheer, Reinhard Scheer, he returned to the harbor, and then that was one of the cases where the German propaganda actually beat the Allied propaganda in World War I, and they succeeded in telling the world the story the German Navy has beaten the Royal Navy. At second Trafalgar, uh, Germany rules the waves. Which, of course, was not true, because the, even though the German had su succeeded in a tactical success, they had uh, not changed the situation, it was still closed in. But Reinhard Scheer was um, then called the Sieger of um, the, the Sieger of Skager, yeah, the victor of the Battle of Jutland, um, and he and his second in command were then um, given the opportunity to accept the aristocratic form uh, to their name. Yeah, this is what you were alluding to, Dumont, Dennis. Yeah. So Reinhard Scheer could himself have named from then from that point on Reinhard von Scheer, but he refused, and the reason probably is we don't know why. Um, is that he came from a middle-class family, rose through the ranks from being a midshipman, then second lieutenant, first lieutenant, until he was then an admiral at the end of his career. And I think he wanted to stay to his roots. He didn't want to join the other class. He felt he had been the exceptional case of someone from a normal family going all the way up to the highest point in his uh, branch, 
and so he refused uh, to accept uh, the font, so he called himself still shaving. However, and let me just finish on that note so I can complete the certain tense of our name, though it has nothing to do with Glenn Miller. Um, he was a little bit vain because he saw himself also as the winner of the Battle of Jutland. And uh, he, as I mentioned before, had two daughters. And at that time, it was absolutely normal practice whenever your daughter married, she would, of course, accept um, her husband's name. But his main concern was that the family name Cher would, as a result, vanish and no longer be there. So he adopted my grandfather, Rudolf Hennings, and gave him then the right to call himself Rudolf Cher Hennings. And that's why my name is the double name. And uh, last weekend, I was invited to a uh, anniversary commemoration event in Denmark on the island of Jutland, and I'm there as uh, together with the my, if you want my opposite number, the grandson of John Jellicoe, who led the uh, Royal Navy, and we are part of a commemoration event every year to well, help up and preserve the memories of the fallen dead, and uh, it's a very nice event, and try to make sure that these things do no longer happen on our planet. So very good, thank you. Dennis, tell everybody about your book. His book came out about a year and a half, two years ago, and uh, is available here. And for years, you know, the question was asked, what really happened to Glenn Miller? And Dennis spent five years researching that, and now he has literally written the book. Well, it's interesting. Recently, many of you may have heard that an archaeology firm in Pennsylvania, Tiger, has announced they think they found the plane. They haven't, but they're announcing that they might have. A fisherman in Britain, Cornwall, probably 50 to 60 miles west of what the flight path of the aircraft should have been and probably was, claimed that in the 1980s, 87 to be precise, he on his, was trawling his fishing lines and caught, hooked into a, his net, and pulled up a silver aircraft with American national insignia on it that appeared to him to be a Nordeen C-64 Norseman. He thought that he would be in trouble with the British authorities for dragging up what he thought might be a war grave, and he immediately released it and put it back into the water, and he threw the fish back. So, Tiger came upon this story, even though others had already learned about it over the years and dismissed it. And they are famous, if you don't know them, they're famous for looking around for Amelia Earhart for the last 30 years. And they've mounted five or six expensive <coughs> expeditions to the South Pacific, and they claim that Amelia and Fred Noonan survived the running out of gas <coughs> looking for Howland Island, and they survived on a desert island um, until they perished from famine, starvation. Um, and they, they've been seeking evidence to prove that. They haven't, it's been inconclusive, and they continue to raise funds to do so. Skeptics say that they are using Glenn Miller to raise money. Um, that may or may or may not be the case. I find them to be fairly professional. There are some inconsistencies with the fisherman's story. Um, not the least of which is the fact it's not in the location where the plane would have been. Second of all, they claim it's a silver plane. The aircraft was painted olive and gray theater paint, according to Army Air Force records. So somebody's ignoring those records uh, conveniently. And of course, the obvious, there is no other plane. Because according to the United States Air Force, there was a, a violent accident. You know, this thing has been, this thing was, we did it, we ran it in the flight simulator at Maxwell Air Force Base at the Air University, and we ran it 20 times through the simulator. And 20 out of 20 times, given the conditions that Flight Officer Stuart Morgan faced at 2.55 p.m. on December 15, 1944, 20 out of 20 times he crashes. So the plane was put in a position to fail. But what I'm driving at on this is that Having gone into the water, even if it hadn't been a violent uh, entry into the water, um, after 75 years, 
an aircraft constructed mostly of wood and fabric would no longer exist, and it would have no longer existed in 1987 either. So that's the latest of what's going on in, in that world. I wanted to mention one thing about Glenn. This seat is empty because Al Gray, who otherwise would have been here, Jerry Gray's son, who we met last year, unfortunately Al's brother-in-law passed away last week and he had to stay home. So I wanted to mention that before we forgot. Yes, Al was on our panel last year and uh, provided a lot of input and stories we hadn't heard before. Music-wise, uh, David, is there something uh, that's been discovered in, in recent history that nobody knew about, that showed up somewhere? Well, the short answer is yes, uh, followed by this happens all the time in parentheses. And that's largely because the sheer number of broadcasts made by all these bands. Uh, the problem is they're not all universally recorded by the same outfit. If they were, there would be an archive already. And, and as in the case of NBC and sometimes of CBS, you had the network making recordings and they, they held on to it. Or in the case of Miller for his CBS show, he hired a transcription service, Harry Smith in New York. And Smith had a number of uh, contractees and it was his job to record them off the air. And so this disc stayed in an office. Uh, but then you have uh, kids around the country who were addicted to this new music and somehow they scraped enough money together to have home disc cutting equipment so you have private recordings made by various people, some in high school, some in college. Uh, off the radio. All of the, off the radio. <laughs> and that was then. Now, where have all those discs gone since? Well, if you troll eBay every so often, these things pop up. Uh, Reinhardt can give you some exciting stories about how things come and go very quickly and you can get into a bidding war for something extraordinarily rare that people didn't know even existed. So the answer is these things show up all the time and sometimes we're just blindsided by the surprise. Dennis, when are we going to hear some of the more things that, that are in the archive? I know Steve was working to perhaps you know release some more of the air checks and that sort of thing. The, as I've said in the past, the original discs have to be carefully transferred from disc to um, a digital domain. That is yet to be done with the discs. However, RCA made tapes from those programs. Some are edited, some are intact. And somebody on this panel knows some more about the edited tapes, which I'll, he, he might want to discuss in a moment. But, long, but the short answer to that is, we have just finished an inventory at Sony Legacy. And we digitized 3,000 16-inch transcriptions. It took a, a bit of time for them to accomplish that. Um, many of those are Glenn Miller, most of which are already known to everyone, some of which may not be, but They've, they've, they've been inventoried in the past. Many Tommy Dorsey's. Um, those recordings were set back by RCA from the NBC catalog um, for the purpose of someday possibly using them for record releases, and they have used some of them. T to give you an idea of the business metrics of this, we did a Frank Sinatra on the air CD set four years ago, which was highly claimed and well received, which is very gratifying. We intended that to be an eight CD set, of which three of the CDs were, were all Frank singing with Tommy Dorsey. And these broadcasts from the Hotel Astor Roof in New York are in pristine audio condition. You never heard Frank sound so good. Well, um, the powers that be at Sony Legacy decided it would be a four CD set. And they liked the CBS Frank Sinatra shows from 45, 46, and 47. And they dropped the Dorsey down on half of one CD of Dorsey. And I was 
I was very disappointed at it, <laughs> put together three. So there are some economics involved, and I think that the good news is this, and I'll leave you with this thought because I don't want to give too much away. We are currently at Sony Legacy putting together a plan to not just monetize, but rationalize the inventory that exists in the vault in Iron Mountain, Pennsylvania, and to make public through probably online access, because most now of their distribution is people paying 99 cents a track or $8.99 an album online. Their physical CD business is dried up. That's not a bad thing because all of that overhead of producing those CDs can be um, uh, bypassed and then we can hear more of Glenn Miller's sustaining broadcasts. And I can tell you that the Miller Estate will be very um, supportive of the Chesterfield programs um, eventually being released. Now, you know I've always said, do you need to hear all 38 versions of In the Mood that appeared on Chesterfield over a three year period? And the answer for most collectors is yes. Yeah. <laughs> All right, I think you were pointing at Reinhardt. Uh, I was. And it shows. <laughs> Reinhardt knows something about the Glenn Miller tapes he might want to share. It's an interesting story. I have to be careful. I know you have to be careful. It's fun. Uh, well, as I said, uh, I don't know how to phrase that. Yeah. Well, as I said before, uh, Carl, uh, once I got into uh, my collecting activities and realized that uh, whatever RCA had issued as air checks uh, on either uh, already shown in the Blue Room or the Café Rouge or on the five, uh, five LP set with Glenn Miller and then they had a similar set with two LPs for Tommy Dorsey. At one point I realized these are just excerpts of complete broadcasts and where are these broadcasts? Uh, and um, to make it not too long but I I had a very fortunate visit in 1986 with Wally Hyder, and he brought me in contact with Brad McCune, who was a former RCA engineer. And he sold me uh, back then, uh, first by, uh, by way of cassette, and then later he uh, sold me 16 inch transcriptions um, of all Ari Shaw NBC radio broadcasts. So they're all uh, at my home, um, and I've treasured them since then, and they're still sort of part of my core collection. Uh, they're not the only uh, crown jewel I have, and I'll come to that in a second. And uh, these broadcasts sort of got me going because they gave me what I would call, I hope David, you agree with that term, training power with other collectors because I had some things others didn't have. And that sort of got me in touch um, with numerous people, and I then kept going back to Brad and said, Look, Brad, I know you've also been involved in. Uh, LPs and um, where are the complete broadcasts and he helped me then to, uh, he actually sold me all the RCA tapes of uh, the NBC remotes. I think I can tell that, no? Yes. yes. Okay. Yeah. I already did so. Because, we're, <laughs> because we still have, the he sold you copies that we still have the full set of tapes. Well, we, we can debate that, but they're excellent. Two the tapes, there two tapes there are two tapes there are two tapes there are two Okay, sure. <laughs> so then I kept asking him uh, about the Chesterfield shows, and he said he he knew the person who had them, and his name I don't want to mention now, but I wrote him a letter, that person, uh, and referred to Brad McCune, and that was sort of in the mid 1990s, and I never heard a response from that person, and um, then ten years, approximately ten years later. Uh, I should maybe say I'm a lawyer, I work with a commercial real estate lawyer in Dusseldorf, uh, and being a lawyer, and I have a lovely wife, four, four sons, none of them is, has, shares my interests, so my domestic and professional responsibilities, of course, cut my time available to, uh, to, my, well, to the jazz and swing interests, and I knew, uh, love to quote Ed, always saying, I wish a day would have, would have more than 24 hours. So, but actually, one day I was, I don't know, it was in July, July 2002, I think. Uh, I was going along my aisle in the office, we have a large international law firm, and my secretary called, uh, said to me, and hey, Mr. So-and-so has called you. Okay, 
I immediately saw the name, and I, I knew this is the person, but it's his son, to whom he wrote about 10 years ago, The Chesterfield Show. So I called him, and he said, um, well, we're the heirs, and we've got all the Chesterfield Shows, and uh, we are trying to sell them. And uh, I said, all right, uh, I know who you are, why don't you send me a list? And he sent me a list, and the list was uh, basically the complete transfer of all the Chesterfield shows going from 27 December 1939 till the 20, uh, 24th of September 1942. Um, all the material that was recorded is dated, say, by, by the Harris Smith Recording Service. Now, the purchase price uh, was quite uh, steep. And I had been very good friends with uh, Ed Burke at the time, who was the producer of Fanfare Records uh, and, and uh, uh, Soundcraft, uh, because most of you know him. And Ed and I then sort of struck a deal uh, and said, all right, I'll buy these, uh, all these Chesterfield shows, and um, then we go ahead and issue them to the world. And he had lined up uh, the son of another actually quite famous band leader, uh, Les Brown Jr., and he wanted to step into the distribution. And I said to my wife, look, this is the purchase price. And then I still have faxes and emails from the <coughs> uh, showing me how much money we would make on these uh, tapes. So I bought the tapes, I got them home to Germany, uh, and then I uh, did something pretty smart. I hope, I, I think it was smart. Uh, well, I was already, well, I had almost half retired as lawyer because I was going too rich through the Chesterfield shows. I dropped a message to Ed, Ed Polich, and Ed mentioned to me, congratulations on uh, having these tapes, and you will certainly enjoy them. Um, and for me, it was actually the dream come true. Yeah? You are in the office, and out of the blue, somebody offers you all the Chesterfield material. Yeah, yeah. That's, uh, it's the best thing that practically ever happened to me. But Ed said to me, these tapes, they're a little bit dangerous, because um, the, the provenance is not clear. It's possible that they were um, acquired, maybe not with the full approval uh, of the Glen Miller estate. So if you go out and... Uh, That's an understatement. Yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> so if you go out and implement your plans, you may actually run into trouble. And you said to me when we get to it, we would have nuked you. <laughs> so uh, the next thing after Ed gave me that advice, uh, and that's sometimes good if you're a uh, member of a big law firm, I uh, got one of our copyright lawyers in Germany. They said, hmm, this is strange. And then we got uh, some of our... Uh, New York copyright people on it, and I asked them, so what happens, can I issue these tapes? And the uh, clear answer was, under no circumstances. You can have them, and enjoy them, and do, copy them for yourself, maybe trade once or twice, very small amounts with other collectors, otherwise the best advice we can also give you, this was in line with Ed's advice, keep them for yourself. <laughs> but and that's what I did. Everything goes full circle. I want you to know, though, from time to time, moment you start spending radio hour programs or other things, presentations here. If we can't find something, we ask, and Reinhardt has been a very, very staunch supporter of the Glen Miller Archives and the estate in terms of lending materials from these, but it's shortcut time where we don't have to go back and drag them out of the vault or something. And he's also helped us several years ago. We had, we had had a series of requests from universities because Glenn Miller in 1940, late 41 and all 42, the band was dedicating tunes on their Moonlight Serenade to different universities and colleges around the country. So the University of Miami um, uh, was one in Florida, um, even the University of Colorado, the we have a performance dedicated to the University of Colorado Boulder um, that plays in our Heritage Center in, in, on campus. And the source material for that was Reinhardt. So this is all going full circle. And I should yeah. at Burke, he was very upset. So after uh, the legal advice came back from my New York partners, uh, which uh, well, supported what had already been told in, in, in the German office, 
I called him and said, look, we're not going to go ahead and we'll not be rich. <laughs> and uh, I bought these tapes and actually I said, Ed, for me the main purpose was to get this, this material because it's something I always wanted to have and I'm happy the way it is. I don't have to go out and issue them. He was very upset with me. Yeah, I mean, we may, I mean, I think we can say Ed's approach, and that's not you, Ed, the other Ed, Hedberg, uh, his approach with licensing and copyright, I think, was quite loose. <laughs> well, we solved that by acquiring. Okay, yeah. so, yeah. but uh, I would say uh, we were then back on friendly terms maybe a year later, but for yes. a year or so he was not happy with me. Yeah? But I feel we're still very good about uh, the way I did it. Yeah. All right. Questions? Hey, Terry, can yes. I make a quick comment sure. about some of the stuff they were talking about? It's yes, pretty fascinating. But it made me think about something that was, it, it's not about lost or, you know, tapes or things of that nature, but sometimes we think about forgotten things. And I want to give um, Nick Hilscher a tremendous amount of credit for going into the archives and pulling things out that have not been taken out or signed out from years like 1960, 1972, 1959. Right. And the reason why I know this is, we were having a conversation one day, my husband and I were sitting with Nick and we were just, uh, just talking, and um, we were talking about, uh, his, he loved certain tunes that my dad recorded, so we got into a conversation about that. And he goes, my favorite is a song called Everything I love, and my husband and I looked at him like this because that's sort of our song. So I said, "Oh my gosh! I mean, do you guys even play that? And I, I, I don't think I've ever heard it." So the next year, when I saw him, he opened. In fact, it was here. The curtains opened up. He came out, started the show, and he did this big thing. You're talking about two grown-ups out there crying their eyes out. He played the darn thing, and then backstage, and he sang it as my father would have, and he came backstage and I said, where, where was this? He says, it's in the archives, and I looked and it hasn't been signed out since 1960. So he brings songs, you know, there's hundreds and hundreds of songs that the Miller Band recorded. We go to a 90 minute or two hour concert. We're not gonna hear hundreds and hundreds of songs, but if anyone ever wants to hear anything, anything that's really important, and you can get word to Nick, he'll get it. He'll do the best he can to sign that out because he loves bringing some of the things out that people loved then. And so I like the idea of saying, I'm gonna, re I'm gonna just play, and not just the popular ones, but I'm gonna go back in and dig through the archives and pull out some things that were very meaningful and very important and very popular. And so I like to give Nick uh, you know, a lot of credit for that because it's not only what he's doing with the orchestra and how much he means to that orchestra, it's teaching them to go outside, go past that limit and bring the people what, you know, they would like to hear. Some songs that haven't been played in a while, so that's not really a found tape, but it's a forgotten idea that I love that he's willing to say, we don't forget. Nick did something very special last night, other than surprising David. <laughs> you will have heard a tune last night when it started. I guarantee not one person in this auditorium knew what it was. And it was Jack and Jill. And what you heard in the beginning was an instrumental, full instrumental opening, opening on the score that exists and existed then. And the band played in live appearances, but not on broadcast, and they never recorded it. So this thing starts out, and you might have thought you were listening to something from Billy May in the early 1950s. And the answer is, that there's a, the coincidence is the arranger was Billy May, so that's why it sounded like Billy May. But you heard the whole thing, and this is where Nick's so wonderful. The only recording of that that exists from the original Glenn Miller Orchestra in 1941 was on the Chesterfield broadcast, and it's abbreviated. The whole front end of it isn't there because of time considerations. So Nick does things like that where we would not otherwise have ever heard it. Questions? Yes, ma'am. I want to um, get a perspective from you on the uh, panel. Uh, and Dennis will remember well. When the Glenville Archive at the University of Colorado Boulder acquired the Burke Collection, 
um, Steve Miller, Glenn Miller's son, uh, was encouraging us at, at every front to get this collection, secure this collection, uh, and he called Ed Burke the biggest bootlegger on the planet. <laughs> that um, was accurate. <laughs> yeah, this was a witness. <laughs> um, and I understand that those of us who want to hear the music want to hear the music. Um, but how is this process viewed uh, generally? You guys want to answer first? Yeah. Viewed by whom, so? Uh, these recordings that we know that are copyrighted, um, right. that are sequestered in vaults and what have you, Somehow they find their way out uh, and uh, are acquired by private collectors or what have you. Um, uh, is, is this something that is viewed as an acceptable uh, approach? Oh dear. Um, that depends on who you talk to. It has it is become accepted, not acceptable. And the reason I say accepted it is more expensive for an owner like the estate of Glenn Miller to pursue a bootlegger, say in the, let me find a, a venue that, where there might be some of them, the United Kingdom. Um, I say that facetiously, that's the home of bootlegs. In any event, um, you would find that you would spend more money chasing them around from having put your product onto a CD then it's worth going after them. And of course, the internet has made this an impossible task. Because we, we have this happen every single week with Star Spangled Radio R. There is a gentleman who I will not mention who has a YouTube channel. channel. Remember, the internet allows millions of people to suddenly become broadcasters. Even though actual broadcasters who are licensed in the federal government have to pay royalties or copyright fees to the owners of the music to perform it or, or share it. That still exists. That, that anachronism in some people's minds still exists. However, lovers of freedom on the internet will take a program that we record from our archives with the permission of Sony Legacy, and they will eliminate our comments and then throw it on the YouTube channel and say, I am now the expert on Glenn Miller. I'm sharing with you all these treasures. So they've stolen it. That's now acceptable in our world as it now exists. So from that point of view, that's bad. But from another point of view, going back in time, most collectors very much appreciated Ed Burke and other what we call minor labels or, or, or informal labels for putting out things that Sony Legacy or the other quote unquote formal licensees didn't. So there are two points of view. How about copyright law in Europe and the USA? And we're now approaching. Do we have to have several hours? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> let, 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 let me just, um, the, let, let, let me just uh, because I'm That's more or less also why we could just simply not afford to do something which was not absolutely beyond, like, uh, <coughs> absolutely clearly legal. But the advice uh, at that time I got was um, not only should I not go ahead and not issue that in the United States, I should not go uh, and do the same uh, project, and pursue the same project in Europe, because uh, it was not clear whether or not my tastes had really been legally obtained. So uh, I was at risk of that going forward on a worldwide basis. So that was absolutely an uh, off-hands project for me. Having said that, the copyright laws in Europe, uh, I think they, were, they may want to change that, but uh, until now they were more lax, and even though they had copyright protection in the US, uh, it's for the same product copyright protection already expired in Europe, so very often uh, people who had material, broadcast material of whatever band, they would go to Europe because the copyright uh, period had already expired and they could proceed and issue the material legally. For example, that was also um, some of the, the suggestion that was made to Lauren Schoenberg when he uh, found the Savory collection. Uh, numerous people approached him and probably accurately 
I said to him, look, what, we understand you have a problem to issue uh, these broadcasts, especially the Ben Goodman material in the US, but go simply to the UK or Germany or Switzerland, then you can do it and you will not be harmed. Uh, but I think he, he did want to do it because he felt, and I agree with him, he wanted to issue it in the United States, and if he does in the United States, he wanted to do it properly. And he's put out that uh, six CD box uh, via Mosaic. We received, our, we received our $265 royalty check from Mosaic last week for the three Glenn Miller tracks that are on that CD. So that leads me to world, one real quick statement, and that is that there are many producers, independent producers, or European producers, that will come back to the Miller estate and or Sony Legacy or both and correctly, properly license, sub-license from Sony because in this case, the artist, Glenn Miller, and his heirs have an exclusive agreement with Sony Legacy for the corporate descendant of R.C. and Victor to release music by Glenn Miller. Recordings right. by Glenn. Oh, well, Reinhardt, we're glad you're not in prison. <laughs> so <laughs> so, so <laughs> Yes, Victor. Hi, I agree with Jen. I love it when Nick picks out different songs that we haven't, you know, like everybody plays Tuxedo, all the other ones. But last night he started, uh, I'm stepping out with a memory tonight, and I turned to my friend Loretta in the intro. All I heard was in, I said, yes, I'm stepping out with a memory tonight. Bill has never heard of it. She never heard of it. I turned to my friend, the band leader in front, I said, have you ever, no, I said, I've never heard of it. It's a beautiful song, but I've never heard it here. I, know, I said the same thing to my husband. As soon as it started, I said, yeah, I, I love the song, but most people have never heard of it. But it's beautiful, and I, he played three songs last night that I never ever heard of. And we like to hear some new ones, so it was wonderful. Yes, sir. <coughs> I'd just like to add, we absolutely love the songs he pulls out of the archives. And my wife and I kind of tracked the Miller Orchestra. Uh, we saw them in Milwaukee two weeks ago, the day before that in Oshkosh. And he was, he was playing those songs there. And we talked to Matt and he said, shh. <laughs> <laughs> so I really doesn't know about these yet. <laughs> they're, they're absolutely the best. We love it. I have a Tommy Dorsey question. And, and this is kind of how I kind of <clears throat> dissuade Glenn Miller. Uh, my father had a cousin named Alan DeWitt who sang with uh, Jan Sabbath, Tommy Dorsey, a couple others. That's kind of how I got into Spike music. <clears throat> I've been able to track Glenn Miller pretty well. But I can't find much about Alan DeWitt, except he replaced Jack Leonard, and he was replaced by Frank Sinatra. Do you, the Tommy Darcy folks, know more about that, or, or is there some channel I can pursue to learn more about that myself? My father's passed away. <coughs> I think, like you, I know that he was, what about the one? So was short. Uh, sure. I can't remember with Jack, did, did he jump or was he pushed? Uh, I think he was pushed. Well, he was encouraged to seek employment opportunities yeah. elsewhere. Yeah. <laughs> and my cousin was too, it's not me. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure. I, the, the tenure with uh, Jan Seven was many times. longer. Longer. Yeah, I know more about Jan Seven. After the war, I lose track of Alan DeWitt. Uh, one thing, uh, there were so many singers, very good singers whose careers just never really gelled as solo <coughs> Music changed. Uh, not everybody could make the transition, and some gave up music altogether. They had another profession, maybe they had a college degree in, or uh, they went to work for their brother, or uh, you know, all, all different sorts of endings for a lot of these careers. An example of that is B. Wayne. She sang with so many of the bands, and she died recently at 100 years old. And she said she would do one of those famous songs and get like $50 for the session, and then Artie Shaw would use it forever, or Benny Goodman, and uh, that was it for her. And Helen Forrest as well. And Helen Forrest, yeah. But Alan DeWitt is like a lot of the male singers, and female singers of that era, as David said, where once the war was over, 
you would think you would have heard more from a lot of them because suddenly more opportunities should have been opening up as the bands receded because they were uneconomical to run and move around. Um, and, you know, singers took different paths. Some ended up in, in radio, on radio network series. Others, like Jan's dad, formed their own band and did pretty well. So they, they all took different directions, but we're remiss. We don't have anything on that one that I know of. I, we'll look into that. Last, last I heard, you had a small band touring the Midwest, but that was... Yeah. Well, the name is very familiar. I have a of pictures of it. Do you have any pictures of it? Because we do. I have one. Yeah. Yes, sir. I have a frustrated Glenn Miller fan from way back. The reason I'm frustrated because I love the Glenn Miller ballads, of which there were scores and scores of ballads that were played by the Miller band, either uh, radio transcriptions or recordings, sung by some guy by the name of Ray Everly. And uh, Jan, you may be familiar with that, but I mean, Devil May Care, uh, Fools Rush In, you can just name scores, I've mentioned. And the frustration is that at concert performances, as we've seen last night, they were great, and I like the introduction of the various uh, uh, <coughs> tunes that were not uh, normally recorded, And uh, but they just about always have to play Tuxedo Junction, In the Mood, Three of Pearls, and so on, which are great. Don't get me wrong, but uh, that frustration is relieved a little bit at the dance because more of the slow ballad tunes are played at that time, but I wish that they would issue recordings that has nothing but the ballads. I mentioned that once to Nick, and Nick's response was that uh, it probably wouldn't sell because they need to mix in other type tunes. But anyway, I've expressed my frustration. I can sit down and leave now. Yes, but you and I would buy it. <laughs> send you to two box sets, one on the Japanese RCA label and one on the American BMG, now Sony label, that are still in the inventory, and most of those tunes are available on uh, one time. You don't have to buy the whole box set. Every single one of Glenn Miller's studio recordings, all of them are issued, are available. And so, if someone is a completist and wants all of them, you can have them. So they do. They do exist. They, they, they do. <coughs> yes, sir. The man from. Yeah, thanks. Good, good morning, everybody. I'm uh, sorry from London. Uh, so many questions, but I won't hold it. Dennis, I'd like to ask a technical question. I would live geographically in North London, so I'm close to Abbey Road Studios and Twinwood, where I've been to. I recommend you do visit Twinwood. A technical question, uh, Dennis. When Glenn Miller and the other bands of the era did their recordings, I assume the recordings are continuous. How did they technically do this? This is before the days of the, the Magnavox, which it? It was came at the end of the Second World War, whatever. How did they actually do it? Because I know there were the V discs, which were huge things, but when you when they the recordings like the Chesterfield broadcast, um, they seem to be continuous. How was it actually technically done? So if, um, there's other questions. But I'll, I'll well, look, look, there's Thank two you. answers to that question: broadcast and studio recordings. And the studio recordings were they would make two copies. Of a master. I mean, you don't want to make one copy and have it break, and you wouldn't have your, your record, you would have wasted your time. Um, many of you have heard the story in the past, people have told where they would cut things in the RCA studios, and then um, one of the original first cut that they do, the band would play with them, destroy them, people would take them home, they, they do all kinds of things with them. Um, but I think you're driving at the broadcasts, and the broadcasts, of course, discs. 16-inch transcriptions that NBC and CBS Network used for most of their programs, including big band programs, um, 15 minutes a disc. So they'd flip them. The engineer would have two turntables in front of them. And they would flip 
they would one play through and then they would start another. So that's why when you listen to when we digitize these things, you have a break in the middle that you can hear the one run out and the other start, and then when we put them together to play them in their entirety, a little bit of the end of one and a little bit of the beginning of the other are put together to form one. In the case of Glenn Miller's Chesterfield programs, those were smaller discs, the, the Harry Smith, they were 10 inch. And there's two discs per program, one and three, two and four. Part one, part three, part two, part four. Again, you're flipping the discs over as you go through the program. Somebody's manually doing that. And think about this for a minute in terms of compliance for radio stations and networks at the time. How many discs they had to pile up to prove to advertisers on commercial programs that the ads ran as bought. So they had to keep that end of the FCC for compliance purposes. They had to keep a track of what they had put on the air. So there were quite a few discs piling up and they were very heavy and you know cumbersome to move with them. And today I can take one little stick that I can stick in a little tiny little thing and it can contain out as much as it would have been on this whole stage. Basically, I've got the idea, you know, it's like when you see the old film studio, and you see the spot come up on the right hand side, when they're changing the reels. That's a similar sort of uh, system, it's a similar sort of system. Yes, but that would be in a film studio where you're trying to sync the sounds to the film. That's a, that's a different question. Uh, okay. And then all those transcription discs at radio stations, as technology changed, often they got carted out to the dump, and uh, thankfully, or if you were lucky, somebody said, do you want to take these home? That's so right. Throw them out. <laughs> so that's why some of these broadcasts still exist, because somebody uh, didn't let them get to the landfill. Last question. Yes, sir. Good morning. You partially answered my question. It, over the past 30, 20, 30 years, a large non-network station in New York pumped its record line. Could you folks give uh, an a guesstimation of what was destroyed and be replaceable? You're talking about WNEW? Yes. Don't know. Probably most is gone. But that could probably got divvied up among a number of different people. Who jumped in and grabbed something. He didn't go quietly. No. no. People who could, there are collectors who, it's a more polite version of dumpster diving. <laughs> uh, no, that was that was a frenzy. That was a free for all. The yeah, yeah. Yeah. The work gets around very quickly. Well, they didn't all get thrown out. People grabbed it and ran with it. This is WNEW, and you better get there this morning. Right. Or, or it's going to be thrown out. Well, we, I have a good story for you. You know, the big bands like Artie Shaw, Tommy Dorsey, a number of bands worked at MGM Studios in Hollywood. Reiner has this one. Um, do you know that MGM, of course, they were recording all these big discs while they were making movies. Not just of the bands, but all of them. I mean, studio orchestra, everything. There was a point in time where, and, and it's there if we ever went digging for it, a lot of those records are underneath I-5 <laughs> in Culver City. They were buried underneath the road in Culver City. They really are. They don't, the discs from the studio are under the expressway. There was a Frank Sinatra box set came out 10, 12 years ago where somebody went to MGM and it had been sold a number of times and the guy was told, you're not going to find anything. And they did, tucked away up in Nixon Cranny, so some of it is still out there. Time is almost at the end. Final comments. We'll start with you, Jim. You know, uh, I think the main reason that the scholarship program was started was because um, from that very small donation that grew and grew and grew uh, was because um, Glenn would have, and I think the family also, wanted to support future music grades, give them the opportunity to train, go to school um, and do things like that. And as time moves forward, we see some of the um, 
possibility for them to get financing being cut and cut and cut. And so for those of you who are Glenn Miller Great Place Society members and you do give to the scholarship program, okay, thank you. And if you are not, I ask that you consider whether it's here or other scholarship. You know. uh, if, if what we had here yesterday during the stage show is an indication of um, you know, the future of, of, of music is in good hands, then, then it really is. And somebody, um, Ray and I heard somebody say something very wise out of the blue, and this person said, um, children make up 25% of us and 100% of our future. Right, Mom. Uh, let me just add one thought, because you just mentioned children. For me, it would be very important to pick up on a point that uh, Tom Doherty said uh, yesterday when he finished his performance. We must preserve this music for Prostoria. That's my main concern. Uh, unfortunately, interest in our music, be it Glenn Miller or any of the other orchestras, is unfortunately waning. And um, I would hope that we can, well, reverse the trend and uh, yesterday for me was really a renovation to see so many people being excited to hear the Glenn Miller band also the other orchestras and so many people then getting up for breakfast uh, in the morning at 7 a.m. to listen to Tom's orchestra again. That is great but I think unfortunately it's not enough. We need more people to support the music because otherwise, well I think interest will wane and that would be very sad because uh, in my, to me and my heart, this is the most beautiful music. Thank you. This touches on something uh, Reinhardt and I and Sue Cass this morning are over at the, at the Super Ray for all the great minds meet. Uh, <laughs> it's true. Uh, but uh, you know, in the collector scholarship world, uh, we can look at these objects and knowing cool things about artists of the past as you know, they're the nuts and we're the squirrels. But there's more to it than that. Uh, the love for this, I think, is a recognition that this is our culture, that this is important, that this is an artistic endeavor uh, that was of such high quality. It's an absolute shame that it's slipping through the fingers of the country. And so we become, in a way, evangelists for that culture. Uh, and the way it survives is it's passed on. And it's, you know, my opening comments, I, somebody said, well, how did you get into this? And I said, my mom, uh, you have children, you have grandchildren, uh, you work in schools. Uh, if the fire hasn't been lit with these people and these institutions, uh, you have to get involved. Uh, because the culture at large doesn't always support you you have to decide whether this is important. And I think all of us here in this room can agree that this is important. Well said. There was one question that, sir, you, I think you had a question and we skipped by you. Well, I was just thought I wanted to share an incident, a uh, true story, uh, regarding uh, preservation. Plantation Act starring Al Jolson. Uh, they had the film, but they lacked the soundtrack. Somehow or another, a few dedicated researchers located a widow lady in Maryland, rural Maryland, and her husband had worked for the Vitaphone Corporation company. So they made some inquiries to the lady. Did, did your husband leave any discs or recordings? And she said, well, there were a few in our barn. <laughs> <laughs> Hard to 
believe the truth. So they located a disc. Plantation Act. Broken in five pieces and put together with epoxy. Now, of course, we're talking about high tech. These people are technicians to the nth degree. How to extract the pieces that were glued with epoxy without damaging further the disc. <laughs> they developed an idea of placing the disc between two sheets of glass and setting it out in the sunlight. Very high tech. <laughs> but at any rate, it did the job. It melted the epoxy without warping the disc because it was placed within two sheets of glass. And with computer technology today, David, you wouldn't believe it. You'd have to hear it on YouTube, mm -hmm. which is available to listen to and watch how they synced it up. That somehow or another, you can't, you would never know that it had been cracked in five places. But it's just phenomenal what they can do with recordings today. Thank you. Thank you, Glenn. That was Glenn Mittler who is one of the most, I don't want to embarrass you, Glenn, but you are really one of the most thoughtful and wonderful people of this community. Yes. Glenn, as many of you know, spent many years um, tracing down and communicating with veterans and people in the industry with letters and testimonies and photographs, and he's been a wonderful help in preserving history. So Glenn, I don't mean to embarrass you, but you are one of the very special people in this world. Thank you. And very quickly, the closing comments from this end of the rostrum would be that Steve Miller's direction was always to not just preserve, but develop and share the legacy. And he was focused like a laser beam in his own way. This is sometimes a little abrupt, but Steve's focus was, as Jan points out, and as David has very eloquently pointed out, the next generation and the next generation after that, and to focus on the students, the educators, the researchers, and to continue the legacy of the Big Band era and Glenn in particular. And I can say that that was not only Steve's focus, that was Alan Cass's focus. Paul Tanner, everyone else involved that you've seen over the years on the panel. And I think that's the message that Johnny would send you this morning, which is to back David and Jan and Reinhardt up and say, yes, we must preserve, we must share, and we must develop. And the thing we've heard the internet mentioned a number of times, like so many things, it can be a bane and it can be a blessing. Correct. And that's one way young people can be exposed. They're going along and what's this? And you never know what might pull the switch. I've been coming here since uh, 1986. And of course, it was mostly the World War II generation folks uh, who were here back then. And they would ask me, being one of the younger folks then, <laughs> what's going to happen to this music? Will it stay alive? Well, I'm here to tell you, so far, we're still here, yep. and so is the music. So uh, hopefully it will be for some time to come. So thank you all. Next up, we will have a program by Dennis, and uh, we will break for a few minutes here. So thank you.